Hey everyone, this is Clinton. And this is Dalton. And this is the LA Do Wrestling Podcast. So without further ado, oh, let's get ready to podcast! Good morning, afternoon, and evening to anyone watching anywhere they are. This is the LA Do Wrestling Podcast. We talk about all wrestling from the past, present, and future. I am one of your co-hosts, Clinton. You can follow me at ClintonWells2001 on Instagram. And I'm your other co-host, Dalton. You can follow me on Instagram at LA Do Brand. And today, we are talking about something very special. We are talking about the career and the career highlights of the Hardy Boys. But, before we get into that, we need to address some current wrestling news yes uh this past monday night on wwe raw was the final wwe appearance of one Kyrie sane yeah who has been reported to leave the company for a little while now to go back to japan she was recently married this year earlier this year and so the rumor was that she would be leaving the company to go back to japan and spend time with her husband and just be over there she hasn't really had the best storylines currently and Another rumor was around saying that, you know, they're trying to re-sign her mostly to do an ambassador role over in Japan. There's been, you know, the idea of NXT Japan. So maybe they were going to try to get her to do that. So much praise and love has been going towards her from the wrestling community and the WWE locker room. So it's really sad to see her go. But I think it's also good if we can uh, put some praise out for her right now. In the last three years that she's been there, she's done, even though, you know, here recently, it has been kind of a, she had a rocky time, but I mean, even before that, you know, she had won the Mae Young Classic, she won the NXT Women's Championship, she won a WWE Tag Team Championship with Asuka, I mean, she did do things in WWE, and I mean, even though at the very end, you know, she wasn't in the best storylines, she had a good run in her three years there. Oh yeah, that's mainly the thing. It was just mainly the storylines that she was involved mm-hmm. in. Recently, with the on the main roster and the tag team with Asuka, you know, first showing up as a tag team on SmackDown, and then it's just the storylines haven't been the best, especially involving Sasha Banks and Bailey recently. I think honestly, it was when they kind of made them a little bit of a comedic ca- uh, tag team. No, that worked. I mean, it fun. worked, but I'm saying that that kind of led to like the downward spiral of their team I, I mean that's just me though I wouldn't say that just I kind of I kind of lost connection with the team after, after when that started it wasn't that they were fine doing that it's just when you have writers that don't know how to you know properly write a storyline especially for two Asian women in a company predominantly run by white women like in the women's division yeah you just make them comedic and stupid which is when they, they don't think that's what they should do though. Asuka is comedic in her own right just because she can do comedic things but Kyrie wasn't but that's she unfolded a little bit to be in that she dropped the pirate character to be the Kabuki Warriors yeah hate that name but she was fine it fit with her she was you yeah. know having fun it's just when they were writing stupid storylines to make them uh, making them heal wasn't the problem having stupid storylines was the problem yeah, yeah. That's I the mean, only thing I, that plagued her. I mean, I understand. I just feel that, you know, I feel like if they would have continued with her having her own singles run on main roster, maybe that would have been beneficial to her. Well, also, I feel like the injuries recently with yeah. Nia Jax is what also drove her to yeah. stop. Because but, she has a couple scares. But besides, at you know, the end, I mean, she did a lot of great things in WWE. And I think that, you know, looking back, she did a lot. Yeah. And... It, it outweighs the, the bad. Next, um, uh, some recent news that we need to talk about. The Adam Cole controversy. Yes. On the Pat McAfee show. Uh, I think it's kayfabe. I, I think it's kayfabe, but some of it kind of looks real, but I think it might be overall kayfabe. And if you're, not lis- if you're listening and you don't know uh, what kayfabe means, kayfabe is basically just storyline. Yeah. It's the wrestling storyline that in recent years has been dropped back in the 80s and before it was you know uh, you think of Undertaker that's kayfabe he doesn't break character that's what it is that's it's not breaking the story not breaking the character this seems like that because they have had 
Adam Cole and Pat McAfee have had a history in NXT with each other when McAfee was brought on to be a part, like, hosting uh, some of the takeover pre-shows and just pre-shows in general. And then you had them having interactions on the WWE watch-alongs on YouTube when they were watching along the pay-per-view. And most recently when Adam Cole blew up. What makes it kayfabe for me is just the fact that the way he taunts him. When he taunts Adam Cole, ta- you know, talking about uh, how he knows how the bumps in wrestling feel. And calling him short and calling him, you know, saying that everything he got was because of the Undisputed Era. That's kayfabe just because the way he brings up the tag team. Yeah. And the way Adam Cole responds with him saying, I'm the longest reigning NXT champion in history. The way he brings that up, too, is more kayfabe because, you know. But even even though it could be kayfabe, I mean, one thing that I had to look at was, number one, Pat is that way. He does run his mouth. And number two, I'm sure Adam Cole as a person is really proud of that he was able to be the champion that long without people getting bored with his character in but the Undisputed I'm, Era. But what I'm saying is... Yeah, I mean, I know what you're saying. It's just because of the history they've had with each other going at it. Yeah. Even with the tweet that showed the DM of when they were going to meet up for the show, uh, the apology letter Triple H going on the show this past week, it's all story driven. I have it's got to be. There's every little thing that happened in that interaction was story driven. It, it can't be real just because it just seemed too fake to me. Yeah, I mean, I I understand and I agree, but I mean, we'll just see how the weeks go by in the, in the next few days. Uh, more stuff could probably happen with it and whatnot, and or it might just stop after this. We never know. Well, I'm calling it right now. They're gonna have something that take over thirty. Maybe, yeah. He They're might. going to. It's going to boil over. It could be the thing from SummerSlam in 2015. Where they had, uh, was it John Stewart? Yeah, John Stewart. Yeah. I feel like he's going to be on that. It's going to be though. something like that. It's going to be Pat McAfee versus Adam Cole, guaranteeing they're going to have Adam Cole be the babyface. Yeah. Default babyface. <laughs> uh, let's also talk about uh, how they're building up Drew McIntyre versus Randy Orton for SummerSlam. Well, it was rumored. It was for rumored. A while. But. Do you think it's a, it, it, it will end good? Do you think it, I have no idea. You never know. And the reason I say I have no idea is because I don't know what the storyline writers are thinking right now. Yeah. The recent uh, thing coming out about Vince McMahon wanting to push new talent, uh, Drew McIntyre, even though he's not new talent per se, he's one of the rising stars in the company that it, you know, having someone like Randy Orton put him over is a good idea. But then again, you had the rumored idea that Orton was going to beat McIntyre for the title, and then that's going to lead up to Edge having a comeback in 2021 and like winning the title from Orton or something like that, but then Drew McIntyre gets it back again after the crowds come back. I don't know how it's going to play I out. Think These it are could all be... rumors. Who knows if they're true? I hope that's not true. It'd be a BS title change, just like on Raw with Asuka and Sasha Banks. I think it's a big possibility they will put the belt on Orton, but I'm not going to say that's it. my... I don't think that's my prediction yet. It just depends on how the next few weeks go. Orton doesn't need and it. And he doesn't. I, I agree with that. I'm just saying that I don't know if they are going to put him He's with already the belt. a multi-time WWE champion. He's yeah. in his he 40s. Hit 40. Yeah, he's 40. He's He doesn't need it. He doesn't need another world title run. I think I feel like he's fine with the money he's got right now. He it has nothing that. to do with Orton or his character. It just has to do no. with... We're, I think they need to push Drew McIntyre more... I don't think they need to build. I love Edge, and I love that he came back, and I, you know, I hope that he comes back as soon as possible. But I don't think Orton should take it off of Drew just for Edge to win it, and then Drew take it back from Edge. I don't know if that should be the way to do it. Well, that was a rumor. Anyway, I know, but I'm but saying like I don't think that would be the way to do it. Well, Brock was going to put over Drew anyway at SummerSlam, but and, seeing the fact that they're not doing crowds, they're not going to bring back Brock. Yeah, I mean that's that, and that's a Brock thing to do. He would put someone over. So I mean. It's it's something that we have to look at for the next few weeks to know what's going to happen, what's going on. Going off of recent events, let's talk about our topic. The Hardy Boys. The most, not the most decorated, but one of the most influential tag teams in wrestling history. Two people that got me into wrestling out of the three. Absolutely. Them being the Hardy Boys and The Undertaker. Got me into wrestling at a young age, at the age of eight, I believe. Mm-hmm. So... It's a special topic, seeing the fact that, you know, growing up watching them, 
being involved in some of the higher moments of their careers, but also the lowest of their careers. Yeah. And we will get to that. But let's first talk about uh, how they started in wrestling. Uh, they started wrestling on trampolines. Yeah. When they were very young. Like us, we followed suit in that. Yeah. So they had the trampoline... The Trampoline Wrestling Federation... And they would go around to like um, like county, county fairs, 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 and, and kind of they would stuff. just wrestle on these really big rectangular trampolines. And it was one of the coolest. Like when you look at all the DVDs and stuff, it's one of the coolest things I've seen, and it's very entertaining. Oh, it's amazing! Just because seeing the fact that that's how we started too. Yeah, not on a I think square, it's due to the but... fact that we watched that. We're like, oh, we should do that too. And the Hardy Boys were probably the biggest influence when it comes to us, you know, getting into wrestling. Besides Undertaker, of course. And for me, as a young kid, John Cena. But the Hardy Boys were definitely the ones that kind of pushed us to like it and to, you know, just like put in the effort to to watch it and to even go outside and and just get on a trampoline and try to do it. And yeah, I think that, you know, them starting on trampolines is the reason why we try to do wrestling on trampolines and stuff like that. But they started off with the Trampoline Wrestling Federation and then they made their own organization called Omega. Smaller wrestling. Uh, promotion Omega was their little thing it's still it still I don't goes know if it's, I believe I don't know if it's right now given the Dude, all this global stuff circumstance but it was relevant in around 2015 so yeah know that. Mm-hmm. and so you know they ran Omega for a little bit but then Jeff Hardy was the first one to go to the WWF he took over a guy who wasn't able to make it who was under the ring name Keith Davis he took the name Keith Davis and he went against Razor Ramon in his first match I believe it was in May of 1994 and keep in mind he was underage at the time he was 16 he lied that he was 18 he was 16 years old Matt was older than him at the yeah. time but just the fact that he lied to get in the ring yeah showed that he cared about wrestling yeah and then he went on to become Jeff Harvey in his next match against One Two Three Kid, who would later become X Pac. Um, I believe that was in the same time period, same month, maybe. Let's not forget the first opponent he went against was Razor Ramon. Yeah, Jeff Hardy also went against many guys whenever he was the enhancement talent. I know he went against, I believe Owen Hart was one person he went against. Uh, you know, like we said, One Two Three Kid, who is now X Pac. Uh, Razor Ramon, Scott Hall, and a lot of other legends that you wouldn't have put a young Jeff Hardy against. Even especially Matt Hardy. Like an underage Jeff Hardy. Especially that, yeah. And there's a history with bad things happening to underage wrestlers in other promotions over years. And it's lucky that it didn't happen. Honestly, then. it turned out good for him in the end. And it kind of pushed you know, Matt, and they all went together as the Hardy Boys. And they... You could say that, but you could also say it was a bad influence on him. You know, if makes him feel that he could do anything. Oh, absolutely. And, and you'd see that and it. you'd see that later on in his career. Now that probably wasn't the case. No, but, but I mean can, I'm just you saying probably that see you can that see as being that. a little bit of a bad influence on him. Yeah. But then again, things happen and they happen for a reason. Yeah. But that goes into the Hardy Boys debuting. Yeah. Officially, uh originally, I believe in The Brood. Yeah. Uh no, it was with um PS Hayes at first. Oh, Edge and Christian was with the Brood at, first. Yeah, the food and Michael P.S. Hayes in the one of the highlight matches of the Hardy Boys' careers with Michael Hayes was against the Brood. Yeah, Edge and Christian in the finals of the Terry Invitational Tournament, where I believe they would receive one thousand dollars. It was like it was I think it was a little ever, more than a thousand, but it was some ten thousand maybe yeah, ten thousand. It was the first tag team ladder match. I believe that it was out of No Mercy. And it was good. It was it was the it first was tag team ladder match ever, at least in WWE at the time. And it was monumental because it showed the chemistry between the two tag teams. You had Jeff Hardy win and pull the bag down from the top, and it just cemented their rivalry that would go on for the next almost decade. Yeah. And then it goes into, you know, they dropped P.S. Hayes. They formed the new brood. I feel like that was supposed to be a little bit of a heel turn for them, but it didn't really work out. They've won, uh, at that time, a few tag team titles before they really got into 
their triple feud between the Hardys, Edge and Christian, and the Dudley Boys. Yeah. And that goes into the Giants tag team ladder matches they've had, mm-hmm. the WrestleMania TLC match, uh, which was the first of its kind. It wasn't even originally a TLC match. It was a ladder match. It was a ladder match at WrestleMania 17. 16 was the first one. 16 was the first one. And then the se- 17, uh, 17 was, was TLC the TLC 2. T- yeah, it was TLC 2 because the first one was at SummerSlam 2000, Raleigh. Yeah. yeah. Uh, of course, the Hardys did not win the first one. It no. was Edge and Christian. They had their crowning moment winning the tag titles. Yeah. Uh, but that match turned into the prelude into the TLC match because the Hardys had the ladder advantage. Mm-hmm. Edge and Christian had chairs, and the Dudleys were always known for their tables. Yeah. And it went from the ladder match at 16, making the TLC match. Then it went to SummerSlam having the first TLC match. Then WrestleMania 17 having the second TLC match. And going on to the third TLC match on a SmackDown with a fourth team of Chris Jericho and Chris Benoit. Yeah. And that, just having so many guys in the ring at one time, throwing themselves off ladders, beating themselves up. I think Benoit got hurt in that match. I think he crashed down hard on a ladder. I know uh, it's not for the faint of heart. If you don't want to get hurt, you wouldn't have been in those type of matches. Yeah. Like Triple H, he was never in a, he really was never in a ladder match. I think, he, if I recall, he was in like two, really. And it was Rock yeah. and then the DX versus TLC Jericho. Show. Yeah, I mean. Like he That was not his style. It just wasn't, and he it, good and it on shows. Him. I mean, it shows. Well, good on him because it added a few years to his career. He was yeah, able to wrestle longer than most of them. But after you know, they've won a few tag team titles at this point, and nearing two thousand three, brand split happens. The Hardy Boys get separated. They both go their separate ways. Jeff Hardy moves to Raw. He goes on a little singles run where he has a few matches here and there. Uh, he's involved with Trish Stratus in a weird storyline that really didn't go anywhere. He had the first big match of his career, Undertaker, Jeff Hardy, for the WWE Championship on a ladder match on Raw. Really showed that he could be a top contender in the company. Earned the respect of The Undertaker after the match. But then, after a little while, it started taking a downward spiral. Yeah. The only thing when you really look at the 2003, 2002-ish uh, run of Jeff Hardy on Monday Night Raw, the only things you really can, can think about is Trish Strass with him, his uh, feud with RVD when it was the European title and the Intercontinental Championship, a little feud with Shawn Michaels, and then the Undertaker match. And that's pretty much it. There's really not, nothing else to it. The feud with Shawn Michaels is what I wanted to bring up because that they tried to... This was the first attempt to try to turn... Jeff Hardy heel as a singles competitor. Yeah, because they tried, they kind of had him as a heel with Matt with uh, P.S. Hayes, but then and a little bit of the and brood, a little bit of the brood. But then after I think the Terry Invitational tournament, it really they kind of all after became the ladder face. matches. They like the fans couldn't stop cheering him, so they had no choice. Yeah. But uh, the Shawn Michaels feud where he Jeff they had Jeff try to attack Michaels multiple times. That would be I think one of the last feuds sort of feuds it was like a mini feud it didn't really go anywhere because Jeff Hardy would ultimately leave the company that year he would be fired uh substance abuse and he would you know leave the company and retire for a little bit focus on music and then Matt on the other side he was more prosperous yeah uh, going mm-hmm. on to his run he started uh his own feuds and he started getting more traction as a singles competitor, mainly as a heel. And he just seemed... He fit that role more than Jeff would have at the time because Matt was older, Jeff was younger, Jeff was also going through some things, and you couldn't really help him. He, I know Jeff denied going to rehab, and that's what led to his him let, being let go and leaving the company. Yeah. And that goes into his first TNA run after Jeff left the company originally. He retired from wrestling for a little bit, tried to focus on a band. He formed Prox Y Gen, 
with a couple band members that included Gregory Helms. No, Shannon Moore. Shannon Moore, yeah. Shannon Moore. Greg Helms was still in WWE at the time. And then after a while, he decided to go back to wrestling. The door was still open for him to go back to WWE after a while, but he opted to first... He took a little uh, pit stop at Ring of Honor, ROH, I think around... Uh, I think it was still around 2003 at the very end or Late something like that. Late 2003, probably early something 2004. Like uh, he came out, like he was Jeff Hardy, but he came out as Willow. And for like a little bit of the match, he was Willow, and then he like took it off. The fans did not want him there and at if, all. Uh, some of our viewers that are listening don't know who Willow is. Jeff Hardy has an alternate character that he used in his youth named Willow the Wisp. He would later use that in TNA Impact for a little while as just Willow. It was kind of his own masked character where he could act crazy. Uh, but, yeah, his ROH, his initial ROH run, which lasted like a match. It, yeah, it didn't really, he didn't get a lot of fan attention. And if it was fan attention, it wasn't positive. It was very negative. And it didn't last long. And so, he moved on and he went against AJ Styles for the exhibition title on his debut of TNA. Surprise entrant. He filled in the role for Kid Cash, who was storyline injured at the time. Match ended in disqualification. Kid Cash and his bodyguard ran in. It's always Kid Cash. Always Kid Cash. Uh, but it started to look up for Jeff Hardy at the time because wrestling a little bit in the company, he started moving his way up. I know he feuded with Abyss, especially in the Monsters Ball match. He numerous times wrestled for no contender spots, most notably taking a pile driver off the middle rope from Rhino when Rhino became the number contender and would later win the TNA NWA World's Heavyweight Championship. In the that same night. night. In the same night. Jeff would also contend against Jeff Jarrett for the title later on in a ladder match. He didn't win. He was interrupted by Scott Hall and Kevin Nash, who came to just batter the man with yeah. a guitar, leading to Jeff Jarrett also hitting him on top of the head, falling off the ladder. Jeff Jarrett retains. Who would have guessed it? It's TNA. But really, I think that Jeff not winning a belt in his first run. He didn't win the exhibition title. He didn't win the world title. He didn't even, I don't believe, contend for the tag titles. And I think it actually was beneficial for his career. It was because it's it like he, he was like reaching and he was like so close, but then he never won. But I feel like if he would have won the belts, he would have stayed in TNA for longer. But I feel that once he left TNA, and we'll, we'll get to that, but when he left TNA, and got to WWE again in 2006, it was beneficial. I think it kind of took his character, and then it was like, okay, he could be a singles competitor in TNA. Let's see what we can do with him in WWE. Oh, yeah. Because by that point, Jeff was a tag team champion. He was a hardcore champion, an Intercontinental champion, once when he beat Triple H, and then he was a European champion. But besides that, you know, he didn't win a world title. And light heavyweight. And the light heavyweight championship. Thank you for reminding me. Um, Most useless championship in wrestling. I love it. Um, wish they would bring it back in some way. Uh, They'd get rid of the cruiserweight for that. And I, okay, well then I wouldn't because I love the cruiserweight division. That would be a whole other episode probably. Um, but yeah, so I mean he really didn't win a world title. And then he goes to TNA. He didn't win a world title or the mid-card title. But he contended for two out of the three and he, you know, never won, but it was beneficial. It had a couple of good feuds, especially, most notably, with Abyss. Yeah. And uh, really just Abyss. That was the one most notable, because he had the diving swanton, I believe it was at Bound for Glory, onto Abyss, off of the stage. He flew, mm-hmm. and then crashed really hard on Abyss. But the biggest thing is that even though, you know, you, like you just said, that you know, one of the biggest feuds that you can think of is Abyss, and that's pretty much it. Well, for one thing, he was in the company for two years. More or less. May, yeah, around two years. I mean, he, didn't, he wasn't in there that long. He contended for the belts. He, the, I think the reason why he really didn't contend for the tag team titles is, number one, he didn't have a partner. And number two, because if anyone would have been his partner at that point, it could have been AJ Styles. He was with... You know, the world title and the X Division title, he didn't even need the NWA Tag Team Championships. But when it comes to Jeff, the X Division was taken over by Samoa Joe, AJ Styles, the world title was Jeff Jarrett, Sting. Jeff Jarrett. 
just Jeff Jarrett, pretty much. The NWA Tag Team titles was... America's Most Wanted, Yeah, mostly. that's Team Canada, maybe a little bit. And then, you know, stuff like that. Christopher Daniels and uh, Eli Skipper. I think Eli Skipper might have been retired at that point. Maybe not. Maybe, maybe I'm not quite sure, but... I well, mean, not retired, but I don't... That was, might not that was the, the tag team division at that Triple point. Triple X. That, yeah, Triple X, America's Most Wanted, Team Canada... That's about it. Now, this was before, uh, about maybe a year, two years before Team 3D showed up yeah. in TNA. Because at that point, I think they still were in WWE. They were, up they until were 2006. Because they were there, the original One Night Stand. And they ECW. were split up around this time as well. Yeah. Dudley, uh, Bubba Ray Dudley on Raw, Brother Devon on SmackDown. But speaking of SmackDown, Matt Hardy had a much better run than his brother at the time. Because he started his iconic V1 persona, Matt Hardy version 1. And that, probably one of his better gimmicks at the time. Overall, one of his better gimmicks. I think it just had to do with his attitude. Towards his matitude? His, his matitude towards the character. The fact that when he came out, it had the, the matitude facts. And they, and they used that in uh, AEW a little bit when he's that character. Uh, and you know, you'd see all these facts like... Uh, was it? Hates mustard. Hates mustard. Loves sushi. You know, stuff like that. Um, doesn't is, like Rey Mysterio, which we'll get to. And you know what I mean? This is also the time that he took uh, Shannon Moore under his wing as his uh, his first Matt follower. His first MFR, as yes. he says. Uh, and it, Matt Hardy and Shannon Moore were involved with a lot of things, most notably. One, uh, a little feud with Brock Lesnar at the time. Shannon Moore got decimated. Yeah. Uh, but more notably, his Matt Hardy's feud with Rey Mysterio for the Cruiserweight yeah. Championship, where Matt Hardy really cemented himself as a singles competitor, more so because it was more of a quote-unquote prestigious championship at the time, even though for WWE it was a little newer. But it wasn't like the hardcore championship or anything like that, where it was kind of tossed around everybody. Beating someone like Rey Mysterio, especially at WrestleMania, was a big moment for Matt as a singles competitor. Yeah. They had the WrestleMania 19 match, as you said. It was on the main card. It wasn't on like a pre-show or anything like that. It was on the main card. And then they had Ray and Matt in a main event on SmackDown where I believe that Ray Mysterio took the belt off of Matt in the main event and like Dominic was in the, the audience and all that stuff as a, as a kid. Um, and it was like a big moment. And like you said, the, the Cruiserweight title in WWE was newer. And it had prestigious... Ties. Ties uh, in WCW with Eddie, uh, Dean Malenko, Chris Jericho, Ray. all of them. Yeah, Ray himself. You know, it, and they had to kind of make it that way, and I can't think of a better feud at that time than Ray and Matt Hardy. At least for the lower SmackDown mid-card. And also it kind of brought in the whole little uh, Cameron, North Carolina group together. Like, Jeff and Matt were together, but then you had Matt with Shannon Moore... But then on SmackDown was also Hurricane, which was Greg Helms. I think he was on Raw at that time. At that time, but then he came to SmackDown yeah. a little bit later yeah. because he feuded Shane with Helms, Jamie, Jamie Noble. Shane Helms being on uh, in WWE as well. Yeah. Had all that group of friends. And then you had, before that, like a couple years before that, you had Shannon Moore, Shane Helms, and Evan Courageous and Three Count. All North Carolina boys. Yeah. and so, Just I like mean, the Hardys. It's just like the whole little group together, besides Jeff, who was in doing his own thing in TNA. At the time, yeah. yeah. So they were all kind of together, except Jeff and Evan Cray, just because I believe he was retired by that point. At least, yeah, the main roster WF WCW. He was mostly retired, retired just because uh, brought in for the original invasion, but an injury set him back. I believe and then he so. Was yeah, released after a while. Yeah, as, as far as I know, that's how yeah. it went down. But you know, it kind of brought in that group together. And later on, when you you know watch the DVDs of the Hardy Boys and all that stuff, the My Life, My Rules. DVD for Jeff, you see the little group together. And it kind of, this is kind of where it started, I feel. Yeah. Where, when you see him on TV. Um, but Matt's V1 persona led into an altercation with a returning Scott Steiner. Yeah. At Survivor Series. Yes. Madison Square Garden. Which would also lead down to uh, Matt Hardy being paired again as a face with Lita later on in. Uh, Around 2004, 2005. He was traded to Raw. He traded to Raw, went with Lita again, 
had some feuds. I know he had a predominant feud with Kane. Yeah. Over uh, with Lita and marital, like uh, Kane forced her to marry him. Yeah, it was a weird little story, weird story going lines, on. But then Matt got injured. He was off TV for a while, and he was at home. And then uh, I wouldn't say tragedy, but misfortune. Real, real life ties. Real came life into this uh, drama happened where at the time Lita and uh, Matt Hardy were still dating Lita cheated on Matt Hardy with former friend at the time and former rival Edge and Matt Hardy like most people like most normal people shared his uh, frustrations online which got it's him. one of those early online yeah uh, it was like one of the early blog posts blog posts yeah uh, but it did get him fired from the WWE at the time. But there was so much of a fan backing for him that they reinstated his contract, they brought him back to TV, and they started bringing this storyline on screen, which is distasteful, to say the least, because you just had a guy who had a serious relationship issue, a trust issue with a friend, and now you're putting him in a ring together basically hoping that they won't kill each other. And they didn't. And even though it part. is very distasteful. And we'll get was, to more distaste later on. There was great matches in there. The steel cage oh, match. Yeah. The um there's a loser leaves or it's like if, if Matt Hardy lost, he would have to leave Raw. Leave Raw. And if Matt won, he would have been the money in the bank winner, you know, pretty much. It was just like a little ladder match. And uh, Matt did lose, and he went back to SmackDown. Um, but besides that, Matt kind of, after that, he kind of went and did his own little thing uh, just for a tiny bit, and then that was pretty much it for that feud. But after that feud, after uh, Matt had left, Edge did win the WWE Championship. Bigger and better things. He was still paired with Lita. And this is where Jeff Hardy comes in. Jeff Hardy makes his return. Edge just had won the WWE Championship, I believe, or just retained it from John Cena. And Jeff came back. Loud ovation. Challenged him for the title in that main event that night. Didn't win, but it did kind of it throw Jeff Hardy back into the mix. He was back on Raw. He was back in WWE. After his TNA run. And it would lead to more or less better things for the brothers at the time. Because one being on Raw, one being on SmackDown at the time, they had a little bit more room to play. They didn't have to be associated with each other as much. They could do their own thing. And then after that, I mean, they still went on to come back together as a tag team. And they won Not the... before... Uh, Jeff had a little run with the Intercontinental Championship yeah, and he, and against he Johnny Nitro. Nitro, he feuded with Umaga. I think there was a little this may not feud, but it was a little stuff with Carlito. Maybe yeah. he, was in, he was in the title picture um, and all that stuff. So I mean, he definitely was involved in more than he was with TNA when it comes to title picture. Yeah. Um, but then he would go back with Matt. Matt would, I believe, player. come back to Raw for a little bit. They would tag up. They won the World Tag Team Championship. Yes. Feuded a, with Caden Murdoch for a little bit. Yeah. Uh, I know they did have a little stint on ECW, the rebranded ECW. They mm-hmm. showed up for a little bit. They were on one of the better matches of the ECW December to this member pay-per-view. The only good match. The opener yeah. to the pay-per-view, which led... To, that was the beginning of the end for ECW. We will talk about the beginning and end of ECW. I, I love the fact that it's the beginning of the end, but it went on for another... About a year. Well, that focus. That part of ECW, yeah. Because then they really rebranded it to PG ECW. But, then it, but the thing is, is even though ECW, just like we're talking now and in the last episode, you know, ECW uh, reboot wasn't that good. However, at the very end, 2008, 2009, it was like the early NXT, what it is kind of now. It was, you know... The, More or less. It was the bringing in 
new talent and putting them on there. Uh, Jack Swagger, Kofi Kingston, Sheamus. Well, even before then, CM Punk bring him back into or bringing him into the WWE. They out took of ROH. they took Nitro and made him John Morrison. You know what I mean? So I mean, it was just something that, even though it's looked back at something as something bad. It later became something a little better. I mean, I remember watching uh, 2008, 2009 ECW and still kind of liking it. I like the feud with Tommy Dreamer and Zack Ryder at the very end. You know, I mean, I thought stuff like that. Shelton Benjamin and uh, Christian's ladder match at TLC 2009, the opener, was one of the best matches on the entire pay-per-view. I mean, they had good talent. They had good things going on. It started off bad. It ended kind of bad with Christian and Ezekiel Jackson. But... Overall, I mean, it was a failure, but at the very end, it kind of picked back up. Yeah. But Jeff and Matt, they were on there for a couple matches, and then yeah, they, they kind weren't of moved they, on. They were still, I believe, on Raw, and then I know Matt would later go back to SmackDown after a while. But they did have the WrestleMania 23 Money to Make a Ladder match, where they were both involved. Jeff Hardy did his mo- one of his most memorable WrestleMania moments, jumping off the ladder in the ring onto Edge putting them both out of the match. Jeff, I, he would be written off for a little bit after that, but Matt would go on SmackDown and become a United States champion, uh, feuding with MVP, winning the SmackDown Tag Titles, or the WWE, champion, or WWE Tag Team Championship on SmackDown with uh, MVP. Mm-hmm. That feud, we can bring it up because it was a big part of Matt Hardy's career at the time. That feud lasted a very long time, if you think about it. Yeah, it lasted from around... Mid-2007. Seven, to, up until 2008. Yeah, I mean, it really... Ending in 2008. Yeah, I think it was... I might be wrong, but I think it's Backlash 2008, where he lost the belt to Matt Hardy, MVP did. Um, and then Matt would later on lose it and then move on to ECW. Yeah, and he moved on and you know became a world champion in ECW. But that... That feud was something that was really cool, and yeah. it was like, yeah, Matt did his little thing with the Cruiserweight title and you know stuff with Edge, but then he could also be a very strong mid-carter champion. He would lose it later on to, I believe it was Shelton Benjamin, yeah. having him win his first United States Championship, I believe. Uh, but, you know what I mean, it showed that he could still do mid-card stuff just like Jeff could. He was doing the Intercontinental, he was doing the United States Championship, two completely different times, but, you know what I mean, it's just something that... You could see that they both could be tag team competitors, but they could also do things on their own. And speaking of uh, Jeff at the time, besides their little altercations where Jeff and Matt would tag up for a little bit, especially in uh, Survivor Series 2007, where it would be Team Triple H and Shawn Michaels, Team DX with Hardy Boys and CM Punk against Raider RKO, Mike Knox... I believe it might have been Nitro, maybe Nitro, and I believe Gregory Helms. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Because those were some of the people that were feuding at the time. Definitely Triple H and uh, Shawn Michaels versus Red RKO. CM Punk at the time was feuding with Mike Knox. Take a wild guess at who got eliminated first. That was a burial right there for Mike Knox. But well, the thing is, is I'll just bring this up and then we'll move on. I think the whole Mike Knox. CM Punk story was because of Kelly Kelly. It was. And I just think that's, it's funny. You know, I just, early on, Kelly Kelly, uh, it's just kind of funny to me. But But besides the, a couple one-offs, especially with the Hardy Boys tagging up again at Armageddon 2007. It was 2006. Oh, 2006. Yeah. Oh, 2006. I I actually, I'll I'll bring this up because it was actually something I looked at here recently. I wanted to rewatch that that match. That might have been one of the first times where they came back together. Yeah, I rewatched the match on the WWE Network, which you can get for $9.99 a month. Hashtag Um, not sponsored. (laughs) um, But I rewatched it, and I thought it was 2007. Yeah, I could have sworn it was 2007. It was 2006, because I'll tell you why. When I tell you... Eminem. Yeah, Mercury was still there as an active competitor. That's right, because that's when he got hurt. Mm-hmm. And that awful nosebleed, I forgot about that. And, and then, then Paul London. And yeah, and Brian... Bri- Brian Kendrick at the time, not the Brian yeah, Kendrick. Yeah, I was going to say the Brian Kendrick, but that would be later on in 2008. But, yeah. So then William Regal, and I can't remember who he tagged up with. Yeah, but, yeah, so that was 2006. So that was before. But then, yeah, they still did, they still did the one-offs. Yeah, it was one-offs, and- but then Jeff mainly had his mid-card feud, most notably with Nitro. 
He had a feud with Umaga through 2008. But you can't forget Jeff Hardy's second instance with uh, getting in trouble. Rumor had it at the time that he was going to win the Money in the Bank match at WrestleMania 24. He was in the Money in the Bank match, but had to be taken out due to uh, another drug problem. His second violation with the WWE's wellness policy. Which is weird because you wouldn't think that their wellness policy would have... It would have been his first strike, if you think about it, because they didn't have a wellness policy when he first got let go in 2003. This was post... Uh, the wellness policy was post uh, Eddie Guerrero's death. Yeah. <laughs> where it got really heavy, and then after 2007, it got heavier. Yeah. Uh, they were trying to focus on it, especially with... Uh, the tragedy of Chris Benoit. And, like, the substance. Like, it was a big steroid problem as well at the time uh, involving Rey Mysterio and many other... Mr. Kennedy. But when Jeff was slated to win, he got taken out. Second violation. You w- didn't see him for a little bit. And then CM Punk would win. It, had Jeff Hardy not messed up, it Jeff Hardy been. Jeff Hardy could have very well been... He was the fan favorite. Jeff Hardy could have won the Money in the Bank, which he has yet to do. Yeah. And then that goes into 2008. Jeff Hardy came back after a while, redid, reinvented himself at the same time where uh, Matt Hardy was ending his feud with MVP, dropping the title later on to Shelton Benjamin. Jeff Hardy would eventually move to SmackDown. Uh, the WWE Championship happened to be on SmackDown with its champion, or eventual champion after uh, around mid-2008, Triple H. Yeah. Uh, Triple H had held it for a long while. Jeff Hardy feuded with Triple H a little bit on and off, contended for the title. Jeff Hardy also had a few matches with The Undertaker at the time, at least one notable match, and feuded with Vladimir Kozlov, who was the up-and-coming big guy that never really made it. And then there was a triple threat for the WWE Championship, and it was Vladimir Kozlov, Triple H, and they, you know, you thought it was going to be Jeff Hardy, You had presumed it was going to be Jeff Hardy. It was Edge. And Edge took the title away from Triple H. Yep. This set up the feud. The, but uh, going on to the most memorable feud in a moment. This also set up, uh, in ECW, Matt Hardy was slowly moving up the card. Eventually, at Unforgiven, I believe, won the ECW Championship in a Championship Scramble. Triple H still had the WWE title at the time. Retained it. Would later lose it. I believe it was Survivor Series that Jeff Hardy was supposed... Or they had thought Jeff Hardy was going to come back, and then it was Edge. Edge won at Survivor Series 08. The second person to come back... Or not come back, make a surprise appearance to win the championship uh, from its original owner, I believe. No, it was uh, John Cena who came back, won the title... The world championship. Yeah, he beat not Jericho. He beat Jericho. Jericho. Uh, but this set up for a triple threat match at Armageddon 2008. Uh, Edge, Triple H, and Jeff Hardy for the day championship. And before we get into you know what happened in that triple threat match, um, in that triple threat match, I just want to take some time because we kind of went right over it. I know I'm backtracking about. 11 months before, but I, we have to bring up at least two matches from the Jeff Hardy Randy Orton feud at the very beginning of 2008. That's right, I forgot I didn't about want, the I didn't want Jeff to Hardy. not mention it because it was something. I think it pushed the. Later on, it pushed him to become a champion later on. Right. But the match when it was for the Intercontinental Championship on Raw, and then they had the big swan ton bomb off of the. I guess the Tron. Like the it was side, near the Tron. It yeah, was, it was uh, like the, the side, side wall. The side wall, yeah. Um, Which led into their uh, Royal Rumble 08 match. Jeff Hardy, Randy Orton for the WWE Championship. Jeff Hardy lost. But... Uh, it gave him momentum. It did. And this is when the WWE title was still on Raw. This was leading up to WrestleMania 24, where it would be the triple... Ooh, sorry. The triple threat match between Randy Orton, John Cena, and Triple H. Uh... You forget about that sometimes just because how small, it, or not how small, but like how it was kind of like a little blinking, you'll miss it type thing, especially with Jeff at the time because he didn't really seem like he was going to be a contender at the time, but he was at the same time just because he was a veteran, but he was mostly mid-card. 
But you're right. It did set him up later that year to be a contender, which he would feud later on with Triple H for the title here and there. Still being the title picture the entire time he was on SmackDown. And then leading up to the aforementioned Armageddon Triple Threat match where he won. He won the WWE Championship, his first world title in the any promotion, excluding Omega. I don't even think he won the Omega Championship at that point. But who? Oh, Jeff. Oh, absolutely. I wasn't sure if he won it yet. Yeah, I know he did later yeah, he on, was but, the Omega Champion at that point. But first major world championship out of any company he's been in. Uh, although the reign did not last, his first and only WWE Championship reign ended at Royal Rumble 2009. Uh, this was after Matt Hardy had lost the ECW Championship. To Jack Swagger. To Jack Swagger. Up and comer. Uh, the rumored ending for the for Royal Rumble 2009 where Jeff lost the title was going to be Jeff Hardy was going to attack Edge during the match. It was a like, no disqualification match. Christian was going to make his surprise return and help Edge. But that was leaked. They decided to go with a different ending to the match. Matt Hardy came out, looked like he was going to help his brother Concerto, their longtime rival Edge. Matt Hardy turns on his brother, hits him in the head with a steel chair. Edge wins the WWE Championship. Jeff Hardy would not have another opportunity until, I believe, No Way Out for the WWE Championship in the uh, Elimination Chamber. But this set up... This would set up, you know, the original foundations for the feud with Matt Hardy later on in the year. After No Way Out, where Jeff would lose in the uh, Elimination Chamber match for the day title, Triple H regaining the title. And this set up their feud at WrestleMania. The uh, No Holds Barred match at WrestleMania. Brother versus brother, Matt versus Jeff. Uh, this feud also brought in some personal things. Uh, Jeff Hardy, at the time, his house had burned down, lost his family dog. Didn't have the best of time. Had a pyro malfunction while WWE Champion. They would say that this was Matt Hardy at the time. Which is also very distasteful. Yeah, a little bit, but at but it, wasn't, it, was it was more giving, of an accident. It was giving, yeah, and it was giving him some heat. But I really don't feel like some of it should have been brought into the, the story. Well, the pyro is fine. The pyro is fine. You could say Matt His did house that. burning down, saying Matt did yeah, it, is not real. Yeah, that's just... And bringing up the family dog as well yeah. that they had for a very long time and it did sadly pass away in the fire. I think that's a little wrong to say, oh, Matt did that. Like, yeah, it gave him a little bit of you know, heat, but ah, it's just not right. But this was also 11 years ago. They haven't changed at all, but it was also 11 years ago. Uh... Nonetheless, had their match at WrestleMania. Je- Jeff would lose. Matt would overcome his brother after a failed leg drop on top of a ladder. Matt Hardy would then do a twist of fate onto a t- on a chair wrapped around his brother's neck, win the match. Later on, they would have a stretcher match, I believe. And then on a SmackDown. Yeah. And then they had their final match against each other, an I Quit match at Backlash. Yeah, it was Backlash. Um, he pretty much, at the very end of the match, he strapped him down to a... Uh, Matt was strapped down on a table by Jeff, and he went to... I, he threatened to I guess either swanton swan or, or, or leg, leg drop, drop him. Whatever. And then he says, I quit. And so Jeff gets off of... Or tries to get off of the top rope, and then just jumps right through the table... Actually injuring Matt a little bit. Messed up his hand. Uh, messed up his hand. I don't know if he broke it, but he... He wore a cast for Yeah, I mean, a it was a little that. bit... Uh, which would keep Matt out for a little bit in 2009, but... Not you know, much, not, because... Not too long, though. A couple months. After that, Jeff did, I believe, get traded to SmackDown, because this is where he reignited his feud with Edge. Well, I believe right before Backlash... Um, yeah, the draft happened yeah. right, uh, like right before Backlash or right yeah. around Backlash. Well, right, bef- right before Backlash, Matt was drafted to um, Raw. Raw, but Jeff had already been on SmackDown because of you know Armageddon two thousand eight and all that stuff. Yeah, uh, he but he was, was shown on. prominently on Raw for a little yeah, bit. Yeah, for a little bit. Yeah, I, and I do agree because they had the whole they had a big feud and uh, with Matt and stuff. And honestly, the biggest show at that point in time was Raw. It was the one that got most. Uh, publicity and all that stuff. So yeah, it was shown on Raw, but Jeff was still on SmackDown. 
But then he, after the whole Matt Hardy feud, he got back to the WWE storyline. They or not, not a WWE title, world the World Championship, because the World Championship was on there by then. Edge had won the World Championship back against John Cena in a last man standing match at Backlash. Took the title to SmackDown as the both championships, the World and WWE, were both on Raw at the time. Triple H was drafted to Raw, so Edge took the title back to SmackDown. This is where Edge and Jeff Hardy reignited their feud. They had one match at Judgment Day, and Edge won, and then they were... This would culminate to Extreme Rules. Yeah, the ladder match at Extreme Rules, where Jeff would finally beat uh, Edge for the world title after their one match at Judgment Day, and, you know, it was I think it's one of my favorite ladder matches, one of my favorite Extreme Rules matches. Uh, But then... And then, at the very end, after Jeff has won it... And he's about to have an, uh, you know, like an interview. In-ring interview with Jim Ross. And then CM Punk comes out with the Money in the Bank briefcase. One of the saddest moments. His second time winning the Money in the Bank briefcase. Cashing in on Jeff Hardy. Turning heel in the process. Jeff Hardy kicked out of a go to sleep at first. And then Punk hit another GTS. Pinned him for the world title. Jeff once again is robbed of a championship that he rightfully deserved. At the same time, Matt Hardy was going in into a smaller feud, feuding for uh, chances at United States Championship with Kofi Kingston and William Regal. Didn't really do much, but it culminated up to... Both Matt and Jeff were leading up to uh, a couple matches, but most prominently, this leads into a three-hour-long... Monday Night Raw before any other major pay-per-view happened uh, this pay-per-view or this Raw three hours long it was a super show had ECW Raw and smacked it on there our first WWE event we ever attended yes we were there Monday Night Raw a uh, couple historic or not historic but a couple well historic big, yeah. big matches big I mean- matches big moments uh, the first ever fatal four away for the day championship on Monday Night Raw for the vacant Day Day Championship. Um, Jeff Hardy went against CM Punk, who was the world champion, and Edge in a triple threat match for the title. CM Punk retained. This would go on to uh, be what pushed Jeff into his feud with CM Punk more later down, down the line. Matt Hardy was part of a battle royal for the North Contender for the Day Day Championship at the Great American Bash. Which was just the Bash that year. Yeah, it was the, the Great Bash. American Bash. Um, but after this Raw, there, Matt Hardy didn't really have much to do after that. He was kind of pushed to the side. Uh, like I said, he was kind of feuding in like number contender for the United States Championship. Kofi Kingston, Kofi Kingston would eventually be a contender, be MVP for the United States Champion. Uh, his third title at the time if you, or Cuff Kingston's third title at the time and Matt wasn't really prominent until later that year Jeff would go on to feud with CM Punk multiple different matches The Bash was a pay-per-view that Jeff Hardy lost uh, via disqualification I do believe they had restarted the match I think once They Jeff had actually won the match but, as far as I remember... But his win was invalid because yeah. of something had happened. I can't remember if it was a rope break or whatever, but he won the championship, but it was like it was invalid. You know, they had to restart the match. And then after that, the whole eye poke thing with CM Punk happened, which caused CM Punk to hit the ref, and the ref disqualified him, but because... Jeff Hardy's still winning, but Punk retaining the title. Yeah, it's just how, you know, the matches are, how it worked. And this led to... Night of Champions. Well, let's, let, well let, let's just say that the bash was when CM Punk became full heel. Full on heel. Yeah, I mean, it was he was the I don't like you because you're not straight edge CM Punk story. That Bringing was just, just demons back into the mix. Yeah, and it was just, I mean, it was great, but it was a lot to take in at the time. And uh, But then it would lead to Night of Champions a couple where, of weeks later. Where... CM Punk would drop the title to Jeff Hardy, giving Jeff Hardy's second world title run 
longer than his first because his first only lasted for a few minutes. Oh, but this one didn't last long either. No, not in the grand scheme of things. It lasted uh, one pay per view. Lasted one pay per view. CM Punk would beat Jeff Hardy in a TLC match at SummerSlam. But before that match happened, when CM Punk beat him, uh, the Hardys came back together. Was it before or was it after? It was before because um, Jeff was still world champion. And that's right, because Punk was trying to put a chair on Hardy's neck and throw him into a steel post like he had done before, but Matt saved him. Or yeah. no, it was around that time, but Matt yeah, had was... saved Jeff from a beatdown from CM Punk and the Hart Dynasty. Yeah, it led, the reason why I know it was before uh, SummerSlam is only because there was Jeff the, was still champion. It was Jeff as champion. John Morrison and Matt Hardy versus yeah. CM Punk and the Hart Dynasty. On which SmackDown. was Tyson Kidd and Davey Boy Smith with Natalia. Uh, and that was on SmackDown. And then it would go on to SummerSlam where Punk would beat Jeff Hardy and then Undertaker would return at the very end of the match. And this but, would lead to, later down the line, a CM Punk Undertaker feud for a world title. Yeah, for about but, two or three pay per views. I think it was Breaking Point, Hell in a Cell, and. Um, Bragging, bragging rights. rights in the fatal four-way match between yeah. CM Punk, Undertaker, Rey Mysterio, and Batista. But this match would be, would be one of Jeff Hardy's last in the company. Yeah, he would be in this match on that Sunday, and then that Friday would be his last SmackDown. Or it's either that Friday or the Friday after, because yeah, they had a little was, altercation on a, a SmackDown, and then announced that the next week or something, or later that night. It was something along those lines. It's been so long since you and I it's have been both been eleven years almost. Watched that or rewatched it. I have recently rewatched the Bash uh, match and the SummerSlam TLC match, but not the Steel Cage match. So I don't remember if it was the week after or or that same week or the week after. But, but Steel Cage match. Uh, if Jeff Hardy lost, he would he leave. He would leave the WWE forever. How ironic, because CM Punk would be the person never to come back in a few years. Yeah. But Jeff Hardy lost the match, had a final farewell, uh, would be attacked, and would be mocked later the next week. But this would be se- uh, Jeff Hardy's second departure from the company. And after this, he would get in trouble again. Already out of his contract, he had, uh, didn't resign, so he was not with the WWE at the time. But got into trouble again with uh, substances and was arrested. Sat out a majority of latter half of 2009 leading into 2010. Matt Hardy would then go on to have a miniature feud with uh, CM Punk for like a, a SmackDown or so before Undertaker really dug into it's his so, feud. It's such, the Matt Hardy CM Punk feud was so small, it's weeks shorter than the CM Punk R Truth feud later on that year like it i know that's you know, that's horrible to say but it's that it was that small it was, it was only about it was like one, one or, or two, two smackdowns yeah it was only a couple matches because he tried to, uh, cm punk tried to do the same thing he did to jeff chair around the neck into the turnbuckle but undertaker stopped him choke slammed him through a table uh but after this jeff would leave matt would continue to be a singles competitor kind of reinvented his look later on uh in 2010, he would be a part of the Money in the Bank ladder match at WrestleMania 26 uh, in a losing effort, but also took on a protege in the, or a rookie in the first edition of NXT, where it was a sort of reality, not a reality show, but like almost like tough enough, but Stupid challenges and occasional matches and pros and rookies. It was pretty much ECW failed, so let's put something else because we still have this sci-fi deal. And was, so we that still have the time slot, it it's still the deal. And ECW's not working, let's would, retire it. And he would be the pro to Justin Gabriel, which was my favorite uh, competitor in I- NXT at that point because really I didn't know much about Daniel Bryan. And he would later... Justin Gabriel, after he left the day, would later... Uh, be PJ Black. PJ Black. And he would go on to do... ROH, Lucha Underground. Impact Wrestling. Impact Wrestling. You know, he did a lot. Global Force Wrestling. He did a lot of that before they even combined with uh, Impact Wrestling. He went on and did stuff with them. Uh, but, but besides that, Matt... Matt's time in Day in 2010, that would be his last year for a while. He didn't really do much. Yeah. But this leads into... Matt left. 
I believe he went into ROH for a little bit around this time. Or was this after? This Okay, so I, as far as I know, Matt left WWE. He went to TNA with which Jeff. We'll dive which we'll dive into. In but he went to TNA. And then, he, and then I believe he went to ROH and was Big Money Matt. Because the reason why I believe that was after was because he was already married, or at least dating, Red Sky, Sky. Who would later become his wife. And the mother of his three children, um, but I believe his Impact run was before the Big Money Matt storyline. And the Impact run that leads into Jeff Hardy's second TNA run at the time, debuting on a random episode of TNA Impact after a weird X Division match where he came back, uh, sat atop a giant red let's, cell. Yeah, let's just call it the Red Cell with Homicide and uh, Xavier Woods in it. Which was basically pretty, pretty, it. That's pretty much all I remember from it. But, but this would be notable because this would begin sort of another downward spiral for Jeff. Jeff would come into TNA, have his second run. He f- wrestled around a little bit, teamed up with... Uh, I know he teamed up with Mr. Anderson, formerly known as Mr. Kennedy in the WWE, a little bit before he started getting back into the world title scene. Uh, in skipping this, over the X Division, which would have probably been a good fit for yeah. him, but went straight to the world title scene. But this led to Jeff Hardy being in a triple threat match. Yeah. Between. It was between Mr. Anderson and Kurt Angle. Kurt Angle. For VTNA World Heavyweight Championship. At the time, um, Hulk Hogan and Eric Bischoff were in the company. They were kind of calling the shots. They were uh, disagreeing with one another. They weren't. You know, yeah. aligned with one another. Hogan was the def- he was the face. Eric Bischoff with the heel. Uh, Dixie was kind of in the middle, just saying, "You guys have to be together." Yeah, Dixie and... wasn't really a big part of that. No, at the time, she was but... just kind of there. But it did lead into the triple threat match uh, for the world title, Bound for Glory 2010. Bound for Glory 2010, 10, 10, 10. October 10th, 2010. That is the date where everything changed for Jeff Hardy. In not the best of ways because he did turn heel in the match, aligning himself with Hulk Hogan and Eric Bischoff. Hogan turning heel, winning the TNA World Championship, becoming a member of the Stable Immortal, which was a knockoff NWO for TNA, and starting his run as heel Jeff Hardy, calling himself many different things. He was basically the big bad villain of TNA. And he, he tried to make it such a goth, like, Jeff Hardy, Very. that he really, I mean, he, he called himself on TV the Antichrist of TNA. of TNA, which is horrible to say, but he called himself that. And he changed the world title to the Immortal Championship that had his face on it, pretty well, much. Well, the design of the Immortal Championship, which would, he would later on use again, when he won the TNA World title later on down the line. And it looked a little better. Well, he <laughs> redesigned it, but he held both titles. He didn't just replace it. It would also be the Omega title for a little bit, but it was based off of his artwork at the time yeah. that he used. And it was Purple Strap. His his face was on at least the side his plates. His side plates, yes. It was his face on yeah. the side plates. It got awful. And yeah, Purple Strap, Silver plates uh so there was some green in there green and yellow were in there yeah, and on the gems. yellow and i think the funniest thing going a little forward in time but when mr anderson beat him later on for the belt he kept, he the, kept the belt with jeff's face on it just for a little bit just for a little bit but i thought it was funny but this as i said before this is a second downward spiral, or really a third a second major downward spiral for jeff hardy because after this this is when he started abusing drugs again. But this is also when Matt Hardy showed up, correcting myself from the first podcast where he went against RVD. Yeah. Um, but Matt Hardy would join. He would also be a heel in the company. Tag up in Immortal. Jeff Hardy and Matt would tag up for a little bit. After being beat by Mr. Anderson, Jeff Hardy would feud a little bit more in the title scene. Sting would eventually win the world title, which leads into a more one of the most infamous wrestling moments. Probably one of the most infamous, like top three. Top three, definitely in not just recent wrestling, but almost all of wrestling. 
especially American wrestling, um, which is Victory Road 2011. Sting, being the World Heavyweight Champion versus Jeff Hardy the Challenger, Sting comes out as normal, ready for his match. Jeff Hardy's music hits. Jeff Hardy's nowhere to be seen. There's at least a solid 30 minutes. Uh, no, I'm sorry, not 30 minutes. Almost a minute. 30 seconds to a minute. Al- maybe almost two minutes of Jeff's music playing. Well, it's more like a minute, yeah. His music playing, no sign of Jeff. You're just kind of sitting there waiting. It's like, well, where's It was a very Jeff? long intro. Like, there was nothing. He didn't come with texting from the back. He wasn't in the crowd. He didn't have a weapon. You know what I mean? It was just... And Jeff would eventually walk down the ramp. He would come out. You could tell something was wrong. Jeff Hardy was... Um, don't know what exactly it was. I I know one name that goes up is Somas, which is a drug that a couple wrestlers had been abusing for a couple years at the time. It was a bad... It was one of the bad ones. But that was one of the names I know that was thrown up in kayfabe commentaries by a few wrestlers. When it comes to when it comes to just you know his abuse with uh, just substances and all that stuff, I think personally, if it was anything, it was either somas or it was just also his his alcohol or maybe pills too. And, it and maybe pills. and it and it could have been anything. But but anyway, getting to the point, he, he was came under out. the influence. He came out. You could tell something was wrong. Sting. When Jeff got into the ring and the lights came up, Sting could probably tell something was wrong. Uh, Eric Bischoff. Bischoff came down. Didn't he tried his best not to look pissed, and he didn't. He was smiling, you know. Uh, came down to the ring, announced that the match was no holds barred. Went over to Sting and told him, you know, all right, out of the mic, not really audible. I think you can hear a little. He bit. pretty much said, "For the love of God, just make this quick." He said, "You know, he's not fit to compete." End the match quick, and then he went to Jeff. Said uh, it's gonna be a quick match. You're gonna you're gonna lose. Went back to Sting to confirm. Sting would kayfabe push Eric Bischoff. You can see the frustration on, but push him. Uh, the match started. They tussled around for a little bit, but well, Jeff, Jeff also stalled the match. Yeah, he kind of he was he took off his shirt and he was gonna throw it into the crowd like he used to. And then he just didn't. He just threw it to the ground. He was being that heel. But he, he wouldn't have done he that. He was stalling. He wouldn't yeah. have done that had he not been under the influence. Exactly. He was stalling the match. Um, Sting would ultimately finish the match quick. Pinned him. Jeff tried to struggle to get out of it. Well, Sting had hit the Scorpion death drop. Pinned Hardy. Putting all of his weight down onto his uh, shoulders. And forcibly won the match. You could tell Sting was pissed. Jeff Hardy was pissed, even though he was under the influence. He was pissed. You could tell him he was like, "What happened?" You know, like sitting in the corner. Sting was pissed. The crowd was pissed. They were saying, "You know, uh, this is BS." And Sting audibly says, "I know. I agree." And that was the end of Jeff Hardy's well, almost the end of Jeff Hardy's second TNA run because he wouldn't come back after this. This was bad. But then, this is also very bad for Matt, because uh, I think it was before Jeff's departure, Matt had already left the company, being fired, and having his own dispute with substance abuse. I think his was more alcohol, I believe. That's what he really got in trouble with, and went to rehab for. I think Matt had stayed a little longer than Jeff, because, if I'm not mistaken... Uh, Matt would go on a little bit to stay in Immortal, or to what was left of Immortal, and he would try to get in the head of James Storm by bringing uh, Chris Harris back. Yeah, but and but he really wasn't way, there. Wasn't there much. were still, I think, there were still uh, complications with uh, not Jeff, uh, Matt, and you know it was already going to the point where he was going to get released or he was going to leave. And when Matt was released, he did go to rehab. He tried once didn't work he went again and it worked better he was fine um and this is like you said earlier at the point where he would eventually go back into go into roh feud with uh the briscoes mainly mark briscoe and be in that world title feud even though he didn't win the championship he would feud a little bit yeah and Jeff, he, def- he definitely went uh, when he was with uh when he was going against jay briscoe uh, he was most definitely, um, you know, he was most definitely doing a lot. 
Yeah, I correct myself. It was not Mark. It was Jay. I believe Mark was the other one. Mark, Mark was Mark brother. was the one that kind of stayed in the uh, mid card. Yeah, Mark's his brother. It's Jay Briscoe. Yeah. I, you don't really hear about them anymore. Uh, they're sort of in the teen tag team division in ROH still, but even yeah. ROH isn't really running shows right now. But either way, going on from Matt, his success, Big Money Matt, he started his own YouTube channel. He started getting popular there. Jeff, on the other hand, he was he had come back. He was clean, came back to TNA, but he came back apologizing to the fans. And I don't think he would have a proper match for a while because he was still, still trying to get the approval of the fans to trust him again when uh, him being clean. He, uh, this is, to put it lightly, his resurrection of his character because he went through such a tough time that he came back new and improved Jeff Hardy, especially TNA Jeff Hardy. Yeah. Uh, he would go on, you know, he would kind of he would kind of rebrand himself, as you're saying, like resurrection. I mean, he changed his theme song to Resurrection. To resurrection. To sim- exactly, it's, yeah. It symbolized his new coming. Yeah, it was a, a whole, person. it was a different character, it was a different him. And so he went on, he actually won, the, later on he won the uh, TNA World Heavyweight Championship. He beat Austin Aries. Austin Aries after he won against Bobby Roode, mm-hmm. uh, Destination X, using Option C. Um, Jeff would win it this time. He wouldn't at first change it to the no, World he, Championship. He, they, he held both of them, but it I wasn't he, until the next. Did he drop it and then win it back? To I, change the title? I don't think so. Or was so. it I think just it was over the same, same reign? I think it was the same reign. Because he had two or three world title reigns in TNA. Yeah, at that point. I mean, when he when he continued with that. But uh, he character. would eventually lose it to Bully Ray, who would then be announced as the leader of the Aces and Eights. Jeff would then go on a little later to feud, different feuds here and there. Um, he would, again, try to go for a world title in TNA against Magnus. The whole focal point of that was Jeff Hardy. It seemed like Jeff Hardy was going to be a heel again. He was going to go with Dixie Carter. But then it turned out to be Magnus. Magnus turned on Jeff. He won the world title. But this is also the time where Jeff would later on go and feud a little bit. One match with the X Division. Yeah. Or it, Well, no. It was two matches. He had a one match with Suicide, the character, for uh, in the X Division. Didn't win it, but... Then faced Chris Saban when Chris Saban uh, was X Division champion, contemplating option C at that point, and then would go to Destination X, I believe, compete in the Ultimate X, where he would use a ladder. Yeah, but it was that, the whole like that's not even the point of the match at all. But Jeff, just, he's not that Jeff, acrobatic so, anymore. Yeah, but um, this would lead into a point in TNA where they were doing mostly shows in 2014 in New York and this would see the return of Matt Hardy in TNA where they would form the Hardy Boys once again properly in TNA and feud with Team 3D which was Devon and Bubba Ray he was more he wasn't Bully Ray, but I think he still went by Bully Ray. He was still, yeah, he was still called Bully Ray. This was after Aces and Eights and all and that. And this is but... before uh, Team 3D would leave TNA and go to WWE to be the Dudley Boys again in 2015. But they had a, the Hardys and the Team 3D had a good feud, especially with the Wolves at the time. The Wolves having the TNA World Tag Team titles. The Wolves were definitely, you know, they were kind of the replacement for Edge and Christian. But they held their own in the matches. They had, uh, as far as I remember, there was one that was a tables match. There was a ladder match. Chairs match, maybe? I don't... I, it might like have been that. like a full metal mayhem or something. Well, it ended in a full metal mayhem hmm. because that was their kind of TLC deal. Uh, but it might have been a chairs match. I don't know. But it was something along those lines. There was a tables match and there was a ladder match. That's for sure. Uh, but they, you know, they ended that feud. I think Wolves still retain and all that stuff. Um, and the Hardys would win the tag team championships later on yeah. uh, in the following year. Jeff having to relinquish the tag titles because of an injury he sustained in a uh, six sides of steel that involved James Storm. And this would see the push of Matt Hardy as a singles competitor in TNA. 
Matt Hardy would start feuding for the Impact World Heavyweight Championship. And most notably, a Bound for Glory that we attended. Yeah. The first Bound for Glory that we ever seen. First TNA event we'd ever seen. Where Matt Hardy went against EC3, I believe the current champion, and Drew Galloway, who is most notably known as Drew McIntyre, the WWE champion. Jeff Hardy serving as the, almost a servant to EC3 at the time, and then serving as referee, Jeff would turn on EC3. He still faced, but he would turn on EC3. Matt would win the championship and relinquish it almost 24 hours later because of Jeff. Which, storyline, but still. Yeah. But this would see Matt become more willing to go to any means necessary almost to get back that world title that he shouldn't have lost. Starting to slowly turn heel, almost a big money Matt. This is where he, Rebby would come in. And he had Rebby, and then he... Stole Tyrus. He stole Tyrus. He Formerly stole, known as Brodus Clay. He so, uh, stole Rockstar Spud, who is now uh, Drake Maverick in WWE. But, um, yeah, stole Spud, stole Tyrus, who was Brodus Clay in WWE. And Rebby was there. And they were on this little feud. Like, you know, it was a feud between him and EC3 for just a little bit. But then... And then moved on to Matt winning the world title again. Yes. Being full heel, um, big money Matt persona, better than everybody, trying to be the top heel, he would eventually lose the world title. Yes. And then feud with Jeff. And this feud with Jeff would later dawn the creation of Matt Hardy's... What they what people say is the greatest creation Matt Hardy has ever done. Matt Hardy would go against Jeff, and they would constantly go at it and go at it. I know that it was one match in particular... Might have been a no holds bar or maybe a last man standing match, one of the two, between Jeff and Matt. Jeff jumped on Matt. Matt was tied down again to a table. Jeff jumped on him from a stairway in the arena, crashed on him. Match ended. I think it might have been a no contest. But this drove Matt Hardy crazy. And this was the foundation of Matt Hardy's broken character, where he would dyed part of his hair white he would speak in weird ways he was crazy and it was the most enjoyable TV, the most enjoyable wrestling at the time just because of how crazy Matt Hardy was and then you would go on to uh, they would feud a little bit they would feud a little longer and it would end in the final deletion match I had to say it that way at the Hardy compound Yeah, it would be Matt Hardy versus Brother Nero. Uh, and so it ends with Matt Hardy winning, beating uh, Brother Nero at the time, Jeff Hardy. Uh, and then it would kind of. Well, it led to Jeff joining Matt Hardy because he, like, reluctantly, he got beat. He didn't have a choice. And so they started being the broken Hardys. Yes. Brother Nero. Um, they coined the phrase fade away and classify yourself as obsolete. Matt Hardy would say delete all the time. Obsolete was a big phrase. And this would lead into the Hardy's slowly turning, or Matt Hardy slowly turning face. Jeff Hardy. Being, Always pretty much being face. Well, being more comfortable thing. with being with Matt and as the broken character that he was. And they would eventually win the TNA World Tag Team Championships. Starting their expedition of gold. If you if you don't understand the, why we're saying the words that we are, go look up Broken Matt Hardy and TNA. You'll it see it all. The most enjoyable thing ever. But they they feuded with um, what were they called Decay? It was Decay. It, it was, was Crazy Steve, Ro- Rosemary, Rosemary, and, and Abyss. A new Abyss. Well, it was same Abyss, but a new mask, new character. Later, it just became no mask with just like face paint. Yeah, and it was it was this team. It was this feud. Uh, their match with Decay, it would end up in almost like another final deletion where Decay would, quote-unquote, beat the Hardys as the Hardys disappeared. This would be the end of their TNA run. They dropped the TNA tag titles, but they moved on. They moved on to ROH at the time where they would feud with the Young Bucks and continue their expedition of gold beating the Young Bucks for the ROH World Tag Team Championships. 
and then dropping them in a ladder match to the Young Bucks. Which leads into their long-awaited return to WWE. WrestleMania 33, it was a triple threat ladder match for the Raw Tag Team titles. Before the Hardys were introduced, it was Gallows Anderson versus uh, Enzo Amore and Big Cass versus Sheamus and Cesaro for the tag team titles that uh, were currently held at the time. Gallows and Anderson won at Royal Rumble 2017 at that point. Yeah. Uh, The New Day came out. In their saying, ring gear. In their ring gear, saying they were hosts of WrestleMania at that time. So they said, you know, this match is now a fatal four way. And Kofi, would, Kofi Kingston would go and say, now, I wonder who this team could possibly be. And you Ooh. hear in the crowd, you know, the who chants, but Ooh. also delete chants, hoping for the Hardys, something you would never think would ever happen. The New Day starts walking down the ramp. And then all of a sudden, the Hardy Boys music hits. The old Hardy Boys music when they were a tag team in WWE. The arena lights up. The biggest pop in WrestleMania, almost WrestleMania history. The biggest modern pop since Chris Jericho's Royal Rumble return. Yeah. It was huge. This was a huge moment. The and Hardys I, came down the ramp. It was electric. And I love the fact that, you know, as us being Hardy Boys fans watching it on the network live for nine 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 a month. Not sponsored. Um, you could soak in the, the feeling of just how great it was because that ramp was just so long. The ramp long. was so long and the crowd was so loud. And it's, it, there were so many rumors going around that they were coming back. And it's like, nah, they're not coming back. They were just in ROH. They're going to continue ROH. And then they show up the Monday after, or the Sunday after their match with the Young Bucks. They secretly, you know, went to the arena. It was a big secret. I don't know to everybody, but for most people it was a big secret. They would go on to win. This would be Jeff Hardy's first win at WrestleMania. Uh ever. Matt Hardy's had one uh wins at WrestleMania, single victories, but they never won as a team. Matt Hardy never or Jeff Hardy never won. This was his first victory. He had like the longest losing streak at WrestleMania for the longest time. Yeah. And I think it's also interesting that, just as you were saying, you know, they were in ROH, uh, the tag team ladder match between the Hardys and the Young Bucks was the night before WrestleMania 33. Because yeah. ROH, I don't know if they do it now anymore, but it was on a Saturday. They, they do Saturday a lot of Saturday pay per views. Um, which I think, you know, for them to not try to compete with bigger uh, other promotions. Than- other than uh, NXT takeovers, yeah, they were uh, you know they were Saturdays. making you know they were making some money. They were doing pretty good for you know the company, and the night after they have another ladder match, which I think is crazy, especially for their age at the point. They were already in their forties. <laughs> body, yeah, both of their bodies, because um, Matt did a uh, twist of fate off the ladder, which looked like it gave him a concussion. It didn't. Their heads bounced. Yeah, Jeff would do another ladder spot, not breaking through one ladder. But, but breaking through Cesaro and the ladder. Uh, but yeah, so they would win the Raw Tag Team Championships that night. Uh, later on, they would have they would lose the Raw Tag Team titles to Cesaro and Sheamus later that year. Or a little- it was uh, Extreme Rules in a steel cage match. Like the pay-per-view after, they would lose I think the... it was just a singles match. No, I think it was a... It, well, they had one match I'm where Cesaro sure. uh, caved in his teeth. Where he had to have surgery. And that's why he wears a mouth guard. Yeah. They had one match on a pay-per-view. It was either a Raw or pay-per-view. It was one of the two. And then they lost the titles to James and Cesaro. And this started um, kind of the... Almost the end of their tag team run. Because Jeff had left again for, I think... Not left the company, but left for about a title... Or not title. An injury or some sort. He was hurt. Took some time off. Uh, Matt Hardy would be by himself for a little bit. Start doing his Woken character. Which was a spin on his Broken because he couldn't get the copyright. Feuded with Bray Wyatt. Eventually culminating in another final deletion. Where Matt Hardy threw Bray Wyatt into the lake of reincarnation. Matt Hardy eventually gaining the trust of Bray Wyatt culminating at WrestleMania 34. Matt Hardy winning the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal with some help from Barry Wyatt. But 
they would later go on to win the tag team titles. They would later drop the tag team titles to... B team, B team, go, go, go. Third generation superstars, Curtis Axel and Bo Dallas. Brother of Bray Wyatt. Yes. Uh, But then this would... uh, Bray Wyatt would be taken off of TV, Matt as well, but Matt would later be moved to SmackDown. Him and Jeff tagged up again wearing retro gear. Mm-hmm. And but this would, would be this would be a little after uh, Jeff would come back, and yeah, Jeff had the United States Championship the oh, night I believe or it was the, week the after. it was the the week after WrestleMania not the week after I'm sorry the night after WrestleMania 34 he would be in a match with uh, he would tag with um, Seth Rollins Seth sorry, Rollins Seth Dean Rollins Ambrose. And, Finn, Finn Balor. Oh, Finn Balor, yeah. Yes. Finn Balor. Jeff Hardy, Finn Balor, Steph Rollins against Miz and the B team. Yes. Uh, and then he would later go on to beat, I think it was the next week, Jinder Mahal for the United, United States Championship. And then move to SmackDown. Yes, Superstar Shakeup, and he would go to SmackDown, and he would feud with Randy Orton for a little bit. Uh, I really personally, I, before we get into it, I think it should have been a triple threat feud with Shelton Benjamin included. I think it would have boosted his career up a little bit at that point. But the feud with uh, Orton and Hardy lasted a very long time, and it was a pretty good feud. But uh, before that, Jeff had dropped the title, um, and they did start another tag team title run. Yes, they would wear their retro gear as you Retro were gear won the SmackDown tag team titles. Had a short, short reign, and then Jeff Hardy had to drop the titles again. He had a leg injury and would be out of action for a while. This would culminate in Matt just having creative frustrations while Jeff was out, especially after Jeff would return. This was uh, post-Randy Orton feud, and Jeff would be out of action. Matt would be back on Raw frustrated with creative on WWE Jeff uh, wouldn't return for a while Matt would eventually leave the company after uh, putting over Randy Orton to start up his feud with Edge or really expand his feud with Edge and Matt would eventually leave and go to All Elite Wrestling AEW Jeff Hardy would come back to Smackdown and begin a feud with Sheamus after a few episodes where it would talk about his uh, fighting his addiction again, this time alcohol, and uh, leading to a feud with Sheamus. And while Jeff was out uh, on injury before he returned, he, he went to rehab yeah. for all this stuff. I believe he, during his time out, during his time out he, had, he a, had a DUI? His second of... Uh, the time because he had right after he came back to the day when he was out he did have a DUI and then when he came back and then was out again he had another DUI but but he, did go to rehab for his uh, it was alcohol abuse this time because it was drinking and driving both times came back fixed himself up but then led to a distasteful storyline yeah which I believe here recently when this when this is recorded, um, I hope that it's over. It should be over. It led to Sheamus kind of doing a CM Punk, talking about Jeff's alcohol abuse, leading to trying to frame him for a drunken hit and run in an in Intercontinental Championship tournament. Jeff and Sheamus would feud, leading to uh, the most recent SmackDown. Where Jeff beat Sheamus in a bar fight. First ever bar fight, they say. I think it's not, but... <laughs> First ever bar fight. And Jeff would win. Hopefully signif- uh, being the little significant flag that this is going to be the end of the feud. So that they can both move on. It's being reported that Jeff is not going to re-sign... But he has, still has a few years for his contract to expire. But it's said right now that he's not going to resign. I think he might. But then you have Matt over in AEW doing his own thing. Currently, he is dropping all of his characters because of the most recent times. 
everything going on in the world uh, is what he said he did bring broken Matt Hardy back for a while and then having like a kiddie pool of water from the lake of reincarnation where he would get thrown into during a uh, stadium stampede match turning into all of his different characters doing week by week different characters big money Matt V1 Matt retro Matt broken Matt and now just Matt but it it does seem like Jeff may leave he may stay who knows in the next few years Matt Hardy is definitely staying in all elite for as long as his contract is they definitely have a uh, a hall of fame induction in the future I believe Jeff will have another possibly a world title run definitely a intercontinental championship run if Jeff can win uh, the universal title somewhere down the line which I do think may happen it could be a f- a Fiend versus Jeff Hardy match at some point. Yeah. Maybe in a Hell in a Cell if the time allows. Maybe just a cage. Because they could pop, they could definitely do that in the Performance Center. Yeah, they could. Even if it was in full a... sale, they've done a steel cage in full sale. Yeah, and if not, you know, they do some cinematic matches. They could take it outside. Oh, yeah. Build it up out there. Um, but we've pretty much, in this entire episode, we've went through about two decades worth of... Uh, probably three decades worth of more two, Hardy but Boys, almost three decades. Yeah, I mean, worth. with with all of them from their from their trampoline oh, wrestling yeah. federation days, so it'd years. be three decades. Um, looking back over, you know, everything they did, you know, starting off with the trampoline wrestling federation, Omega, uh, getting spotted out by Jim Ross, being trained by P.S. Hayes, Dory Funk Jr. Uh, going to win WWF, WWE, WCW, TNA, ROH. NWA 2000 Omega Tag Team Championships going on to do singles competition winning championships multiple championships and all of that Jeff winning Slammy Awards in WWE Matt going that doesn't count (laughs) Matt going to you know have one of the best wrestling characters in the last decade probably two decades they've done a lot yeah and I think that they're probably one of the best tag teams that have ever done professional wrestling. They're one of the best tag teams to step foot in the ring. Exactly. Uh, before we finish off this episode, can you name one match that you recommend someone who is listening right now? A Hardy Boys match? A Hardy Boys like, match. Like, yeah, singles? A- anything. Any. Anything. The... The original TLC. Or, technically not the TLC, but WrestleMania 16. If not... uh WrestleMania 17, the ladder match, TLC match, whatever you want to call it, one of those. It, even they'll say it's a spot fest, but it's still good. It's still a good match. I don't get tired of watching it just because the the most like iconic ladder match spot, Edge spearing Jeff Hardy off the top. That's one of the biggest things I've ever. You know, it's one of the most iconic moments in WrestleMania history, in wrestling history, in ladder match history, tag team history, whatever you want to say. That is definitely something to rewatch, nostalgia feel, and it, it's it's good. Even though it's not a traditional match, it's still good. It's still iconic. Yeah, I definitely feel that if there's one match that anyone should watch, it's a Hardy Boys match. Should be the WrestleMania 33, because not even just the match itself, but if you've never seen a Hardy Boys match or you're you're not very familiar, just listen to the crowd when they're coming out. It's you could tell that they're very famous. And they were very excited that they came well, they're back. They're very liked. Very liked, yes. And um, that's one match I believe that you should look at. So the WrestleMania 33 ladder match or WrestleMania 16 ladder match are probably 16 the 16 or 17. Two. Or 17, yeah. Or TLC 3 on SmackDown was probably great as well. Uh, no, just, just either 16, 17 or TLC 2 at SummerSlam. One of those. Hmm. Just do one of those. Don't do the fourth one. Anyway, but... Continuing uh, with one last thing. What was the first moment you remember of Jeff and Matt, whether it's separate or together? It was a video game. It wasn't even a match. It was uh, SmackDown vs. Raw 2008. 2009. 2009. Well, 2009. well also 2008. <laughs> 2009, yes, but also 2008. We'll, we'll argue on that one on a, on a, at another time. Uh, but yeah, it... Definitely a video game, and we'll we'll look through the video games on on another episode. But yeah, 
But this will conclude uh, episode two of the LED Wrestling Podcast. And next week, we will be talking about the career of Goldberg with our editor and friend, Ethan Thompson, who is a big fan, uh, fan of Goldberg. And we'll be taking a look at everything about him and his career. Uh, you can find me at Clinton Wells 2001 on Instagram, our music engineer at chance.cummings.507, and Moon River, which is a shirt brand. You can follow them on Instagram at moon.river.02. They made us some nice custom LED wrestling and LED podcast shirts and hoodies. And you can follow me at LED brand on Instagram and our podcast editor, Ethan, at ethanthompson. underscore on Instagram. Also, make sure to follow the podcast Instagram accounts, the wrestling podcast at LED wrestling underscore podcast and the regular podcast at LED underscore podcast. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next time. Peace.